Well, hello. Uh, welcome to uh, the conversation with the socialists, also formerly known as Sagan, formerly known as <laughs> not just the Progressive Network, formerly known as everything else in between under the sun, but settling on the conversation with the socialists. Uh, I have with me uh, Madeline Hoffman, who is uh, going against two corporate puppets, in my opinion, in New Jersey. She's going against uh, Cory Booker, which is the only one I know about, really, and I really care about. But uh, who's the other person that you're running against? Well, the uh, Republican is Rick Mehta, and all I know about him is that he has, I believe, he has his campaign. Oh, oops, what happened? Am I still with you? Yeah. But I just wanted to, to do something and I lost the screen. Okay, he has his campaign headquarters um, in um, or right near a gym, a gym in New Jersey, in South Jersey, that got into all this controversy with Governor Murphy because they were opening up before um, Murphy made it legal for gyms to open up. Yeah, so, I heard um, about that. Yeah, so to associate, he's associating himself with those folks. So that gives you an idea. Um, I believe he's associating himself with those folks. So that gives you an idea of where some of his politics lie. Um, I haven't focused much on him, um, focused a lot more on Senator Cory Booker. No, that's good, so that's, that's the actual person he's running against, in my opinion. Yeah, he's the incumbent, so yes, yeah. absolutely. So you have some uh, endorsements that uh, you recently came out with. Yeah, I've gotten um, a, a whole string of, uh, I have gotten quite a few endorsements lately that I'm very proud of. Um, I, the um, Tuesday night, Ajahn Mubaraka from formal, formerly uh, vice presidential nominee from the Green Party, he ran with Jill Stein um, in 2016. Uh, he's also with the Black, a national organizer with the Black Alliance for Peace. I also received the endorsement of Jill Stein herself. So mm -hmm. the vice presidential and presidential candidate from 2016 endorsed me. Uh, the current Green Party candidate for president endorsed me. Uh, we haven't put that out yet there for everyone. Mm -hmm. He endorsed me earlier this week. And so I'm very excited about both, all three of those nominee uh, endorsements. And then um, I've received the endorsement of the uh, Green Party of the United States, it's Latinx Caucus. Um, um, uh, you, to see all my endorsements, because my brain isn't functioning the way it ought to right this minute, uh, you can go to my website, uh, hoffmanforsenate.com slash endorsements. Uh, there are probably now in the neighborhood of 20. Um, and some of them are national figures like, like the ones we just mentioned. Oh, the other, the other person whose endorsement I received in the last two weeks is Margaret Kimberly, a Black Agenda Report, um, a longtime activist, Green Party member, writer, and um, yeah, just someone who, she just wrote a book called Prejudential, mm. which is about the history of racism underneath each of our 45 presidents. Uh, this is clearly nothing new, um, racism in the United States. Presidents who embrace or espouse or promote or foster racism, mm -hmm. nothing new. Um, and I was very excited to receive her endorsement. And I've received endorsements from some progressive Democrats who ran for political office uh, in 2020, they ran in the primaries and lost in the primaries. Um, and so they've turned around and endorsed me, people who ran for county clerk or freeholder. Uh, they've, some of those, those um, politically savvy folks have turned around and endorsed my campaign. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, we're making some, we're making an impact. Uh, yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah, amongst people in in this state, and we're getting the attention of some people uh, nationally as well. Mm. 
Well, uh, thank you for taking the time out to speak to me so far. Uh, I know we're, I know you're really, really busy uh, with your campaign and getting you know, the word out about you and, and stuff of that nature. Uh, what is the updates uh, other than endorsements of what's your campaign? Well, there's a lot going on. Um, I was just, there are a number of issues that need to be responded to right away, some of which I've been able to respond to, some of which I'm going to get to work on when we hang up. Um, mm -hmm. One is uh, uh, this whole issue of Donald Trump announcing that he's going to withdraw troops from Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, this is such a, uh, a key issue that the P Russian press has gotten in touch with me, Sputnik, the, the English arm of Sputnik, mm -hmm. um, because it, it has international implications. And yeah. we have, I, I wasn't able to answer all the questions with a definite yes or no. They were, the people, uh, the reporter was interested in knowing whether this was just a campaign maneuver on the part of Donald Trump or whether he really meant it. And you know, and, and then also what the country feels about such things. Yeah. And I realized in answering them that it's really, it's very hard to figure that out because the media and the Democrats have been so focused on ripping apart everything about Donald Trump that even when Donald Trump tries to be or ex expresses, we don't know if it's real or not real, but when he expresses an anti-war sentiment, everybody attacks, you know? It's not real, he doesn't mean it, he's just trying to get votes. Um, but before the 2016 election, people were definitely, definitely tired of all these wars in New Jersey. Not, in the people of New Jersey were very tired of all these wars overseas. Yeah. So, you know, if, if, but the military industrial complex doesn't want it. And we've become very, doesn't want to end the wars. And it's oh. become very frustrating to hear Democrats beat up on a Republican for trying to be, or for sounding like he's anti-war. So it's muddied the waters tremendously. Well, it, it seems like he's going back to the, to the uh, Trump slash Democratic playbook because Democrats have said that for the longest time after 9-11, after that uh, as soon as we uh, entered the pretty much wrong country for the wrong reasons, right. and it got them, uh, a lot of them uh, elected, but after everything fell apart, it got them unelected, and the Republicans got elected, or uh, the Tea Party uh, got elected, and then everything went down more, and, uh, the Democrats basically decided to try and become a lighter version of Republicans because they think that Republicans, their donors are the, are the different donors, which they're not. The same overall donors, regards to the, the amount and all that stuff. But Donald Trump is basically going along the same line as, as, as Democrats have, except he, he's playing more leftist right now uh, than the Democrats are. Because Democrats are actually trying to get the middle of the ground Democrats or Republicans. Well, and the Democrat, the my uh, the presidential candidate, for example, Joe Biden, mm -hmm. he's criticized Trump for not being tough enough. You know, not being tough enough on China. Well, if you get tougher on China, what are you going to do? What do you? Where does getting where does getting tougher get us? It gets us into military action. And the Democrats are starting to say all over again about 2020, beware the Russians interfering in our elections. You yeah. know, so if if anybody, and I, not even just Donald Trump, but if anybody uh, tries to, to talk the words back a little and lessen the tensions, it's immediately a cause for concern on the part of the Democrats. And it's just the whole world is upside down. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, we need to withdraw the troops from Iraq. Yes, we need to withdraw the troops from Afghanistan. Um, in Afghanistan, that was 2001, October 7th, 2001, that we first began uh, to send troops there. So we're talking about almost 19 years 
in less than a month from now, when is it going to end? Um, and what and at what cost is our you know involvement there? Human cost and financial cost. Human cost and financial cost to the U.S. Human cost and financial cost to the Afghan Afghan people. When are we going to get out of there? And then to, to hear people saying he oh it's just a campaign ploy or in the past when he tried to remove troops no we can't do that he can't do that because he doesn't understand the military realities of the situation all of that is coming from the military industrial complex where do the people stand on all this i really wish i knew i know that the anti-war voices are as strong as ever uh, there's going to be a seminar coming up in a, a couple of weeks about moving the money out of the military budget into the into programs of peace or community programs. I've been advocating for that for the almost the last 20 years. We don't need to spend $740 billion, billion with a B, as a minimum on these wars. We need the money for education. We need the money to fix the roads, to build, to repair the bridges. We need the money for all kinds of things. And so uh, this is a, a very important issue that's been so, so muddied by partisan politics. If you look at where we are in 2020 as opposed to 2016, we're pretty much in the same place in Afghanistan and Iraq. We've increased tensions with Iran, with Venezuela, with Nicaragua, with Syria. Well, Syria pushed, pushed back against US presence. Syria has more or less prevailed, but we've, been, we've imposed sanctions and tightened sanctions, even in the middle of the pandemic. Um, this is a major issue and my opponent, Senator Cory Booker has said nothing about it. Um, has not voted to decrease the military budget um, significantly, has not spoken out against US intervention in Central and South America, Middle East, anywhere. Um, so this, this is a cause, of con cause for concern. So that's one issue. Um, what, uh, do you have any, you wanna make any comments or questions? Cause I have a couple of other issues I could, uh, I could talk about. Well, I will probably uh, go over them after you, after you uh, you're done with the uh, with the answering or, or the comments that you, the, that you want to say. Okay, all right. So that's number one is the issue on the war. Number two is the issue of baby bonds. I don't know if you heard anything about this because it was I'm a big. Sure, yeah, not, not not very much. I am like, what the fuck is that? Yes. Well, there was a there were press conferences all day yesterday and um, uh, an email from Senator Booker to all of his, through the one of the Democratic Party organizations talking about how incredible this was that not only had he, Cory Booker, introduced a bill about baby bonds, but Governor Murphy was in support of, of baby bonds. But as I understand baby bonds and I'm, I'm writing a response to it, uh, I'm in, in the process of writing a response to it. Basically, for any child born in 2021, they will receive a $1,000 bond, which will then mature and will be available to that baby um, turned adult at the age of 18. So the $1,000 bond might be worth $1,600, $1,800, just shy of 2000, over an 18 year period of gaining interest. So, it, so the interest on that is what, 3% or 1% per like every year or something, yes, I think? Yes, yes. So it will, gain, it will gain in value, but it will not gain, it won't go from 1,000 to 10,000. It won't yeah. go from 1,000 to 50,000, it'll go to, between $1,000 and $2,000, depending on what the interest rate is. And if so- memory, If memory serves me right, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, they had some effect for like uh, uh, when the kid wanted to open the savings. 
Yes. As far as I remember, they had, even then they had a savings uh, dividends of like 5% or some to that effect. And that was per year. So that was like what, an extra, what the maybe, what is it, five, not, not, maybe I'm, my math is wrong on this. I'm not, I'm not, in a, in, I'm not good with it as far as that kind of stuff. But as far as I know, that's like 50 bucks a, a year or some to that effect. Am I right about that? Right, on $1,000, 10%. Is a hundred dollars and five percent would be fifty. Yeah. So they're going backwards on that with this baby bond stuff. Well, the the the, you know, in 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 one way, the intent is okay. The intent the intent is to try to reduce the wealth gap between the richest and the poorest. That's the intent. But when you look at the reality of what that would be. Um, it's not going to do a lot. Uh, people were talking about last night or yesterday in the press conferences, they were saying it's symbolic. It will make all children feel like their lives matter, you know, and that they have some value, uh, something to look forward when they're, to when they're 18. But in today's, today's economy with today's problems, structural differences are what's needed if you want to address the income inequality, you've got to change the conditions that people live in. And so one of those things is a, you know, national health insurance program, improved and expanded Medicare for all so that, especially during this pandemic, but all the time, mm -hmm. people don't have to worry if they have health insurance don't have to worry about going to the doctor, don't have to worry about getting the medications or any of those, those things. Mm -hmm. um, to which, uh, debt, student debt is, you know, out, off the charts. What's going to happen when the temporary hold on student, on the interest on student loans, what's going to happen when that temporary hold is lifted? The housing, affordable housing, what about rent control? How about, you know, when the, when the uh, ban on evictions is lifted or the moratorium on evictions is lifted. There are so many ways, or as we were talking before with the military budget, what about education itself? Availability of high quality public education all throughout the country and state, not just in, you know, wealthy communities. And no, you know, taking the privatization out of education, making it equally available to all, it has a price tag. Mm -hmm. Let's do those things. Let's let's make sure we address the needs of people in their communities. Thousand dollars, you get it today with a promise of it today that you may you may receive in in eighteen years. It sounds nice. You can you make you know, nice sounding speeches about it, but what is actually going to change and what is that child going to do? How, how far is that 1500 or $1,800 going to go? They say, oh, help you buy a house. Really? Um, $1,800, no. you know? Um, no. uh, that would help you buy a house in the Philippines. Yeah, maybe, it may be a very nice one too. Um, yeah. Just, price different differential or, uh, you know, exchange rate and such. But um, so that's, that's another, I mean, on the other hand, I, I just need to give, to draw the full picture. There were a lot of people from the right who were criticizing the plan because, well, I work hard for, I worked for my money. I never asked for anything. Um, so there are people on the right who are criticizing this program for being a handout, another handout and giveaway. So yeah. I don't want to be confused with those folks. I'm not against that kind of thing. But what I, I just don't like to see um, politicians get mileage out of doing something that's just symbolic. Um, the other day, last week, I was in Patterson a week ago. I was in Patterson. This is where the press conference took place yesterday. And they have a nice Black Lives Matter mural that was painted in the street. 
um, as a result of Black Lives Matter activists pressuring city officials to do it. Mm -hmm. And on the other side of the street, or one side of the street rather, is a monument uh, to the Underground Railroad that had passed through Patterson in the 1800s. And I was standing there with a local activist and Board of Ed member saying, all right, I know that people in Patterson are going to make that murals into something, that mural into something real. For mm -hmm. you, it's not just symbolic letters painted on a, on a street. Mm -hmm. and he said, yes, you know, he, absolutely. And we started to talk about reparations. Yeah. We started to talk about if Black Lives Matter, show us, show us how. Mm -hmm. um, don't just say that they matter, yeah. show us that they mm -hmm. matter. And so that's, that's a big part of what my campaign is all about. Senator Cory Booker does not support reparations. Um, the only, the only time that and, that, and that's kind of odd uh, that he doesn't support something that will actually like make his community better in regards to like say uh, redoing the 13th amendment that would not include um, the, uh, the the phrase with a, except for punishment but mm -hmm. that's that's where a lot of the laws that were were supposed to uh, uh, protect as far as the park they weren't they, they weren't supposed to allow a free um, uh, a car blanche uh, reason to uh, jail more minorities based on that amendment and the only person that I that I have heard that's uh, come out with that kind of, a, you know, made me, made, me, made me myself aware of the Third Amendment is uh, Mark Charles, who's, a, who's, res who's also running for president and the in independent. Uh, he's the indigenous person. Uh, so he he brought that part. I'm going, huh, maybe we should look that up. So I did. And that's where I went, oh, it's literally in the Constitution. Yes. So I, unless we um, take, the, take apart the Constitution and take that phrase out, the, the systemic racism in the United States will not will, will not disappear. Uh, and, for, and for Cory Booker to be against something that would actually literally benefit uh, uh, his community all, all all across the United States in itself is kind of self defeating as far as the bar goes. True, and not only would reparations help those who've been wronged, it will help all of us. Mm -hmm. It will help all of us to equalize income uh, or to, to, to move closer to an equalized income. You know, we talk about uh, an eco-socialist Green New Deal, um, Howie Hawkins and Angela Walker, president, presidential and vice presidential candidates, and myself as a, as a U.S. Senate candidate. An eco-socialist Green New Deal means a lot of things. Next to that Black Lives Matter mural, and the Underground Railroad monument that I just yeah. mentioned. On one side is a Wendy's and the other side is a Dunkin' Donuts. Okay, so you look at that and you say, I look at it and I say, okay, so we have corporate America in, you know, in, in moving in and taking, talking about Black Lives Matter, but the basic logic of corporations and the basic logic of, you know, we'll give you a job, but it'll be at minimum wage. It won't be a living wage. We won't, you won't be able to afford the things that you need to be able to afford. And at the same time, we're grabbing up resources around, around the world and rainforests, you know, and for the, for the beef and the, and the, and the hamburgers. And remember during the pandemic, Wendy's had to stop uh, serving some of their I cost their items when factories in the mid Midwest shut down because the levels of COVID were so high and the workers called for that. And this is an exploitative system from top to bottom. Yeah. And what yeah, and what we need to do when we talk about all these issues is restructure. I mean, you you said you talk, used the word socialism before when we were talking. We need to create a situation so that workers' rights are protected. 
Um, and in a, this pandemic has shown us so many different ways in which workers' lives are not under capitalism. Yeah. Um, you lose your job, you lose your, un your, you lose your health insurance. Well, uh, the whole structure of socialism is to, is to prevent worker exploitation. Yes. It is a structure uh, in midst of the policy. And I think that when I talk about that, um, I get in my live or, or just my podcast, I say it's not the person, but it's the discipline. If you are disciplined under socialism in its truest definition, then you'll be able to implement those types of structures and help the workers uh, help the economy through that. Yes, and you know a stronger economy is a more it means a secure, a stronger economy built on on equality and justice. Exactly. Is a more secure society, is a more educated society. Um, and I mean, I don't know how many of you, how many of your listeners um, have been looking at photographs from California. Um, I woke up to that this morning, looked at a, a number of them, and I've heard stories on Facebook from people about how it's 7.30, 8.30, 9.30, 10.30 .30 in the morning, and it's still dark orange sky. Yeah. Um, and people are not, the news commentators are not mentioning climate change or global warming or no. anything along those lines. And if you did it, we created an eco-socialist Green New Deal, we would also be making sure that our businesses and corporations, any business, anything, you know, and, and the jobs that are created would um, be complementary to a, to a sustainable, clean, not polluted uh, world, you know, would protect and would combat the climate change. We would, oh my goodness, Joseph Biden has repeatedly said he's not against fracking. Um, I'm not sure where Senator Cory Booker stands on this, but I do know Senator Cory Booker is in favor of the profit motive of capitalism. He's not, he's a neoliberal. He's not going to try to change the economic system. So as we talked about that thousand dollars per child, um, it's not going to change the basic inequities of, of the economic system we live under. It's not going to address any of the real systemic issues that need to be addressed to make, to make this world more equitable and safer and more sustainable for everybody. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I look at the whole economy and I look at uh, what capitalists have done and I look at what socialism in its truest form does. Yes. And, the, and, and I looked up and I literally named up every single uh, co country that both were considered communist and considered socialism and they have everything we don't have and they're doing better during the COVID-19 pandemic than we have. Yeah. And it's, it's not go ahead. No, no, I'm I'm agreeing with you. And quite a few of them also have free education and very low education as yes. far as thought goes. Yeah, all the way all the way through from um primary education through high school, through college, med school may or may not be totally free, but it's and, at a minimal it's a minimal cost. Uh private so that, school uh, what, from what I read, private schools are not free. Uh, they are pretty much the same cost as, as what a private school would be. But the universities uh, are either low, uh, low cost or free. And, yeah, it, no. and that, it doesn't depend on, it does not depend on uh, where your parent got your money or where you got your money or how much you get paid or whatever. It's, it's based upon uh, the hours that, that you go through because uh, was, I think Germany has a two-three-two system where uh, what, what the earlier degrees is two two years, undergrad is three years, and the final degree is two years. So, or maybe I got that wrong. Maybe it's three-two-three. One or two, but <laughs> the point of the matter is, 
they have a system that is more more uh, efficient than ours, uh, only because of the fact that they put socialism uh, socialism before the capitalism. Well, they put the people before the profit. They put the fact that it's important for every person to have an op to not just have an opportunity. You know that okay, you have the opportunity if you make enough money to take advantage of the opportunity. Yeah. Um, they're providing an opportunity for everyone uh, to to develop into the kind of person that they want to be. And I think I think one of the problems, you know, one of the reasons that the United States comes down hard on Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, trying to overthrow democratically elected Maduro, they're trying. The United States is afraid of that idea. United States is afraid of a national health insurance program, for example. Why, I don't know. And I, I, I need to qualify this, too, because if you saw, if, you know, anybody who watched what happened um, with um, Bernie Sanders in 2016 and also in 2020 and watched the kind of support that he had and saw who came out and what they were, what they were in favor of, saw that the younger, many in the younger generation um, aren't afraid of the word socialism. They really aren't because they see where this country is today and the gross inequalities that exist. And they're concerned about where they're going to wind up or where their friends are going to wind up. They see the racism. Um, they see, they see that a change is needed. And so I don't think, I think the leaders are afraid because of the donors and that they have and the people that put them into office. For me, I don't take money like, I don't take money from corporations. I don't take money from political action committees. I just take money, you know, take small amounts of money uh, from people who want to donate it so that I can represent people for people. I don't have another voice in my ear saying, oh, well, you know, the people might want national health insurance, but our donors don't, so shh, you know, or the people might want to take on the issue of climate change, um, but Mobile, Exxon, Texaco, the rest of them, they don't want, shh, you know, that's not how, that's not, I, I'm not beholden to those companies. I can say what I believe needs to happen. And I think we have a very strong um, youth, um, young eco-socialist caucus, uh, green young eco-socialist caucus in New Jersey, more than 50 people. And they are not connected or loyal to any political party because, I mean, the Democrats are Republicans because they have seen that um, the Democrats and Republicans ju just do not speak for them, do not provide, do, do not think about them in implementing policies. So I would love a chance to debate Senator Cory Booker on these issues, but so far he hasn't debated anybody. He didn't debate anybody in the primary. He hasn't, we, ha we don't hear of any debates that are planned. Um, I and some other, uh, there's only five of us competing for the, for the U.S. Senate seat this time. There are uh, four Democrats and one Republican. Why not have a debate that is open to everybody, all five of us? Let us air out you know, our different points of views. And there are some real differences out there. Let us air them out. Let the public hear the differences and let the public decide. Yeah. Put all our names in public opinion polls, not just not just the Democrat and the Republican. Um, a public opinion poll that came out yesterday or the day before, Booker has over 50%, Maida has under 30%, yeah. um, and 16% are undecided, and 5% are saying they're going to vote for somebody else. Well, who are those somebody else's? Who are the other choices? I mean, we really are at a point where it's just, it happens every two or four years during elections yeah. where 
people are not informed of the other choices. What in the world are our leaders afraid of? They're afraid of, you know, no, if people know there's some other choice, they might actually want it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's um, we need to be, we need to have open debates for everybody and we need to all be included in the polls so that, you know, the, these options, people are aware of these options. Well, okay, now Maine has a ranked choice voting system, right? Correct. Uh, I forget, does New Jersey have the same thing? No. Um, Maine is the only state that has it. Uh, there is a independent Green running for U.S. Senate there. Yeah. Uh, 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 Lisa, Lisa, have you interviewed Lisa Savage? No, I, I've been wanting to, but I, uh, she, uh, someone has kept saying no or said no once, and I, I, I'm on their mailing list. Okay. That's it. Uh, I would I would love to keep uh, interviewing more and more greens. So I know the more I get the greens out, and I, since I'm a self promoting machine, literally in that case, uh, I'm hoping that eventually people will get their heads out of their tails and actually see the greens as what they are, and that's the only viable uh, left party right now, and that's like on what at least fifty percent of the ballots, right? Oh, my, yes, but more. I believe the goal was 41, no, 46. Mm -hmm. And um, the, I not, don't know exactly where the tally is because there's a challenge in Wisconsin to, yeah. to, the, to the, I mean, the Greens got well above the required number of signatures, yeah. but Wisconsin is a swing state. Pennsylvania is a swing state. Uh, Ohio so the, is a swing state. Ohio is a swing state. That's where I'm at, and, and I believe he's on the ballot as independent. Good, good. Uh, so but he's already I got my vote. Yeah, I, great, great. Uh, really, we need people to be aware of both Howie Hawkins and Angela Walker are, are workers. Um, you know, they have background in trade unionism. Um, this is what people really need to hear. By the way, um, we have a fundraiser. Um, my campaign has a fundraiser mm -hmm. coming up on Saturday okay. from 2 to 5 on uh, Facebook Live, Hoffman for Senate 2020. And um, we're going to be auctioning off a Black Lives Matter mural. One of our members created it, not a mural, a, mo a mosaic. Mm -hmm. She made it herself. Uh, she was asked to make a mural for the mother of Brianna Taylor. Mm. She did it, and so she. This is a mural, uh, a mosaic rather, of Elijah McCain, McLean, mm. and another young musician, violinist. It stands two feet high, foot and a half wide, weighs seven pounds. We've gotten one one bid on it from Kentucky. Um, check it out at Hoffman <laughs> for Senate 2020, um, and then we have a program coming up on September 20th, Women Speak Out. Mm. Women, and it's, there's going to be a special introduction by Jill Stein, former mm. presidential candidate, twice presidential candidate Jill Stein. Angela Walker is going to be on it. Um, Franca Muller Paz, who's running for city council in Baltimore, is going to be on it. And um, we hope a, a and a number of other very strong, active political women. Uh, so uh, what, we are. Uh, I'm sorry, Chucky, but uh, would you be willing to give my information to the uh, designer of that so I can talk to them as well, get their name out a little bit more if uh, if possible? Sure. You mean the uh, the mural? Yeah. Uh, the same mural, the <laughs> Black Lives Matter mural, and this particular mosaic. Sure, I will. I will send it to you on. Um, uh, after we've after we're finished. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah. Her name is Robin Brownfield, but I I will send you her information. Okay. In yeah. All right. Thank you on that one. But uh, keep going. I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you. Oh no, no, you you have to interrupt me, or I'll keep talking. <laughs> hey, the more you talk, the more the more you'll get your message out. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, we're we're going to be because of COVID nineteen. Uh, most of the of the votes are going to be submitted by mail and yeah. 
they're going to be in people's hands a month earlier than the election itself. Well, let, let's so, hope so, since, uh, since the post office has had basically a mission of uh, privatizing the whole uh, thing. Yes, but, but the thing is that there are ballot boxes that people can, can drop their ballots off in. And, you know, we don't, we can't, bl a hope, I hope that the post office isn't blamed for problems in the election. Yeah. Because it'll be because there are other ways to get your ballots in and counted. Um, and, but the, what it's doing is it's putting pressure on candidates to get the information out about themselves earlier. So um, we also put up on Facebook um, a form for people in New Jersey who want a lawn sign, a Hoffman for Senate lawn sign, similar to the sign that you see behind me. Mm -hmm. Not exactly the same, but, but very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, so we ask you to go and fill it out if you're in New Jersey. If you want one, two, three, five, let us know. We've got a, a large shipment coming in next week and we need to get them out and we need to get them posted on people's lawns so that people see who we are and see that there is another alternative. And appearing on your show helps. Um, our fundraiser on Saturday from two to five is going to help. And also our program uh, on Sunday, September 20th from seven to nine, women speaking out uh, on politics, on the issues that matter, that will help. And, you know, if people want to reach me by email, it's Hoffman for US Senate at gmail.com. It's Hoffman, the word for U.S. Senate, all lowercase, at gmail.com. You can go to my website and offer to volunteer, hoffmanforsenate.com slash volunteer, hoffmanforsenate.com slash donate if you want to make a donation. We need to make not lots and lots and lots of money, but we need to make enough money to cover the expenditure of the signs and a few other, you know, PR stuff, things printed materials and and the like so um, and, uh, and uh by the way this will be not only going on my uh my youtube channel but also going on to my uh, uh anchor.fm slash combo and socialism uh podcast that'll be okay. Uh, huh okay yeah Just so that, okay. That's, i'll be doing all that uh tonight uh and i you know I share this and i'll share this and maybe we'll get uh, as must donations for, for your campaign, other Greens campaign as we can. That would be really helpful, Calvin. And I really appreciate, you know, you I've I think the first time I interviewed with you was way <laughs> back when what March or April or something? It was uh June ninth. It was okay. June ninth? Okay. I think it was June. No, I'm sorry, it was July ninth. July ninth. We uh, we had uh, just moved over to uh to um to tip in before I moved, before we were able to get up here to uh to Columbus. And the first time we tried, I didn't know what I was doing with Zoom. I thought it was an easy thing. And and <laughs> I wound up having to have you uh, call in. And so with the same computer by the way, but uh it was phone and I was smiling my, from ear to ear with no teeth. And uh, <laughs> that's maybe why I have the mascot right now because I, I think it's a it's a distraction. And I've been proven right. I, I've been doing those uh, the uh, Facebook lives I've been doing with this on. My viewership has gone up. So I'm like, oh, okay. interesting. I'm like, well, I kind of figured. Well, out. you are. You're also getting more confident as you do this. You're also, you know, and and, and we're getting closer to the elections also. Mm -hmm. So maybe more people are interested in your guests. I know you've. Um, interviewed some pretty high visibility guests and you know pe voices like yours are really important to what we're all trying to do. I, I appreciate it and uh, yeah. people like you in, in office would be more important for the country. Well, thank you. I, I am ready. I'm ready and pre I'm prepared and ready. If, yeah. I, if I got elected, I'm ready to serve. Yeah, my uh, computer is kind of kind of go iffy on me right now, so I think we're about past the forty-five minute mark uh, that Zoom gives me for my yes, interview. Yes, So, uh, thank you yes, for being on. 
Uh, I look forward to doing this again. Uh, I uh, reached I've reached out to, to Angela again, hoping for another interview. Uh, but uh, so far, mm -hmm. no response. But that's fine for now. Anyway, I'll keep trying. Uh, I thank you for being on uh, conversation with the socialist, and uh, I look forward to talking to you again. Likewise, Calvin. And I'll keep you posted of what's going on. Um, reach out to me whenever you think would be whenever you have something you'd like to discuss with me as well. And I'll give you the contact information you requested um, okay, after you. we hang up. Okay, thank you. Right. No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I hope you have a good day and uh, I uh, will do my best for you guys. Thank you so much. Have a good day. <laughs> you too. Right. Bye. Bye. Keep up the good work. Thank you.